Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to TTNT, Truthful Transformation Thursday. We're excited and delighted for all of you that are joining us on this Thursday as we continue in our study concerning discipleship. I will uh, give some others an opportunity to uh, jump on here with us as we prepare to see what the Lord has to say about becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ, having a closer walk with him, learning more about him and the significance of being a disciple and not just a church member. All right, we are we're waiting here for just a few moments. If I had some music, I'd turn it on, but since I don't have any, then we'll just I keep maybe next week I'll I'll be I'll be a little more prepared to have uh, some music playing while we're waiting on others to come and, and join us on T T N T. Truthful Transformation Thursday. We certainly hope and pray that you've had a good week. We thank God for a portion of health and strength. We thank God for allowing us this opportunity to come and share on this live feed. Hey, Sister Debbie, I see you. God bless you. Sister Renee, I see you as well. God bless you. Thank God for those that are joining us. Deacon Austin Lane, I see you come across. God bless you, my brother. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're just going to wait till a few others pop on and we will Go ahead and get started. Thanks for those that are here in the sanctuary. Please know that this is hybrid, so it can be online and in person. So we appreciate all of you that will come to the sanctuary and join us here as we continue our quest, continue our learning when it comes to God and discipleship. All right, we're gonna wait a couple more minutes and then we're gonna we're gonna get started. I certainly hope while we're waiting that many of you are making plans already for Sunday morning worship service and we praise God for those that are already planning to come and worship. And we thank God for our ability to have social media platforms and streaming platforms but I must tell you that uh, it's nothing like the atmosphere of being in the worship experience which that's something that we can't get from our uh, from our live stream but we thank God for it for those who can't make their way to the church house can still participate if you have questions, we're trying to monitor the questions. So if you have questions as we go throughout our study, please uh, submit your questions and we will try to answer them in real time if we can. Sometimes it's a little difficult to try and monitor who's typing in a question versus keeping our minds and thoughts on our lesson. So please, ma'am, please, sir, feel free to ask your questions as we go throughout the lesson. All right. Hopefully and preferably others will be getting on here in just a moment. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Let me open us with a word of prayer. Oh God, how we love you. We enjoy you. We magnify your most holy and righteous name. We're thankful for all that you have done, all that you are doing 
and all that you will do for each and every one of us in the future. We pray now your presence in this place as we attempt to learn more about you, that we can be more disciples to your will, to your work, and to your way. And so, God, we pray you would illuminate our minds and our hearts. We pray, God, that you would give us insight. We pray, Father, that you will allow all of what we learn to be applied to our hearts and then to come forth in our actions. We are thankful, God, for, again, everything that you have done, and we want you to know that we love you with everything that we have within us. Be with us now as we go throughout this lesson. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. All right. I think we left off uh, in chapter 7 of the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 7, I think we're going to look at verses 11. I think is where we're going to pick up, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But just as a reminder... Just as a recap, let us understand that a disciple, this is our goal, this is our aim, this is what we're shooting for, to be a disciple of Christ. And a disciple is defined as a student, as a pupil, or a learner. And we want to be that. We want to be students, pupils, uh, and learners. Uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, the word disciple functions as a technical term for adherence to Jesus. A person becomes a disciple as he or she uh, so, uh, sought out a, or seek out a teacher and follow him and his principles. What we're attempting to do is to seek out Christ who is our leader, our head. And we want to follow him and his principles. As we are disciples of Jesus Christ, it is ours to seek Jesus. It is ours to seek Jesus as our teacher. It is ours to seek Jesus as our teacher and follow him. All right. Let us move now to... Luke chapter 7. I think the premise of our lesson, the premise of what we're trying to establish is the fact that Christ did a lot of mission work. Uh, he was always in mission-mindedness. Christ was always finding uh, ways to help people. And I'm convinced that uh, our mission work will drive our worship experience. It's one thing to have a wonderful worship experience, but if you don't have any mission work that you've done uh, prior to the worship, if you don't have anyone that you blessed, anyone that you helped, anyone that you made a difference in their life, anyone that you have demonstrated the love of Christ through your actions, then I think your worship, although it is worship, it is not as authentic as it would be if it was driven by the fact that God chose you and, and is using you for mission work. And so I would, I would contend that our authentic worship is really uh, driven by our willingness, our ability, and our desire to do mission work. As I said, Christ was all about doing mission work. His whole ministry was helping someone, healing someone, delivering someone, along with teaching someone. As you will learn, most of the people who came to Christ and received the gospel did not initially come for the gospel. They came because of the healing that they needed, the deliverance that they needed. They came because they had heard that if you go to Christ, he had the ability to make a difference in your particular situation. And I think that if all of us are true to ourselves, we would admit that when we came to Christ, we came to Christ because we were looking for 
a difference in our situation. We was looking for a turnaround in our situation. We were tired and fed up with the way we were living life and really felt that there, had, there must be a better, a better way of, of life than the life that you and I were living prior to us coming to Christ. And so we began to uh, gather our thoughts, gather our minds around what that life could be and begin to hear the stories, the stories of our mothers, our fathers, our grandmothers, grandfathers, our aunties, uncles, our neighbors who had already established a relationship with Christ talk about the goodness of God in their life. So therefore, when we begin to hear how God helped, how God healed, how God delivered, how God handled certain situations, we began to, to come to the conclusion that, yes, this is the type of life I want to live. So let me go and see about this man, Jesus. Let me go and find out a little bit more about the one that you all keep on talking about that has done these marvelous things and works in your life. And so uh, that mission work, that testimony, all of those things are things that help draw us to Christ. So if it helped draw, draw you and me, then certainly it's going to help draw somebody else. So as we turn our attention to verse 11 of chapter 7 of the gospel, uh, according to Luke, and I'm reading, I believe, from the New International Version of the Bible, we said, uh, Luke, uh, Luke says, soon afterwards, he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples was going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. Now, that's up to verse number 13. Now, I want you to catch the fact that when Christ observed the surroundings of what was going on, he had a compassion towards this woman who was obviously hurting because it was indicated by her weeping that something was seriously wrong. He had a compassion uh, concerning her and, and, and felt for what she was going through and wanted to make a difference. I think that you and I, as we become disciples of Christ, as we move in the direction of being closer to him, as we move into an area of emulating the life of Christ and allowing God to work through us, to use us as instruments, as his hands, his feet, his eyes, his ears, we have to be sensible to the fact that we must notice what's going on around us. I think more often than not, many of us who are children of God, but we are oblivious to the fact of the things that are going on around us. And if we're not oblivious to the fact of the things that's going on around us, many of us don't care as long as it doesn't have an impact on us. I'm getting a feedback, so I'm going to cut this off. Uh, okay, now, is that better? I think it's better. I'm not getting a feedback now. And so because we are either don't care or, or because we are oblivious uh, by what is going on around us, we miss opportunities to allow God to use us in that situation. Because we have to first notice, and if you know, uh, the Bible teaches us to observe all things. We, we, we ought to observe what's going on around us. We ought to have some clue and some idea of what's happening in our midst and seek and see if that is an opportunity for you and I to demonstrate the love of Christ to somebody else. Luke tells us that uh, he felt, he being Jesus, compassion for this woman and said to her, do not weep. Keep in mind, her son, her only son, was being carried 
uh, on a burr, on a coffin, if you will, on a stretcher, uh, going to the graveyard. And this was this woman's only son. Now, not only during this part, in, uh, this time uh, in the Bible, not only uh, is she hurt by the loss of her son, but the fact that her only son is now dead has an impact on her life in many other ways. Not only missing the one that she loves, not only missing the one that she gave birth to, but the fact that her son is dead also suggests that after she gets through the burial, after she gets through all of what it takes when we have a loved one, someone that we're close to us that passes away, she's got to deal with the fact that being a woman during this time, she can't own property if she doesn't have a man in her life. She can't make her own way if she doesn't have a man in her life. And so not only did Jesus have compassion on this woman because of the present situation that she was dealing with, but I'm convinced that Jesus also understood uh, what impact this present situation was going to have on the future of this woman, which means to us that Christ not only thinks about what's going on in our lives right now, Christ is also aware of what's going on in our lives in the days to come. And when Christ blesses us, he don't just bless us for right now. He blesses us for right now and for the days and months and years to come. And when we understand that, then we appreciate the fact that he blesses us, not for just right now, but for what is going to be in our future. That's why many of us don't seem to understand what it means uh, to, to receive this blessing that continues. That is a perpetual blessing that comes from God because many times, many of us, when God blesses us, and gets us out of this situation, instead of us appreciating and understanding that this blessing is going to carry on in the future, we go right back into doing what got us in, the, in, in that shape in the first place. So I think as a disciple of Christ, we have to understand that Christ's blessings to us is just not a blessing for the right now, but it's a blessing for our entire lives. Many of us can confess that at that turning point, we received a blessing from God that turned our entire life around, that made a difference in everything that we were doing and in every situation that we were attending and that everything that was in our past now has changed for the better because of the blessing that God is giving us right now. I wish I had some help with this lesson. So if you can't say amen, even those of you on social media, send us a sign, give us a thumb up, give us a warm heart, but let us know that you understand that when God blesses us, it is not just for the right now, but it is for our lives going forward. Luke tells us uh, that he has compassion for this lady and said to her, do not weep. All right? Now, once he spoke to her, he didn't leave it right there. Amen. For verse 14 says, and he came up and touched the coffin and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. Now catch verse number 14. And he came up and touched the coffin. Now, I, I bring this out to say this. It takes a little more as we are uh, disciples of Christ and, and, and being more like him for us just to say something and then walk away. Okay. okay. He, he said to her after he saw the situation, analyzed the situation, he said to her, do not weep. All right. So he spoke to her. He gave her a word of encouragement. But then verse 14 said, then he came and he touched the coffin. So, so now that he has, he has said something to her, now he's done something in her behalf. I'm simply trying to tell us that it is more for us as disciples of Christ to do than just to tell a person, <coughs> I'm going to pray for you. And then don't do anything about it. Amen. 
it's okay, and we ought to pray for folk. But if the person is in need, and we have that need within our power, then it is for us to not only just pray and let them know we're praying, but it is for us to do something that is going to bring about uh, uh, the blessing that they need in order for them to get uh, to the next step in their own lives. In other words, we got too many folks saying, well, uh, God bless you, I I'm gonna pray for you, but these people are hungry and we got two or $3 extra in our pocket and we don't try to feed them. <clears throat> or we got two or three cans uh, uh, of vegetables in our, in our cupboard and we, don't, and we don't give it to them. Or we know of a way that we can get them some food and we don't help them. Or we know of a way that will get them some help on their rent and we don't mention it to them. Or we know of a way that will help them with some clothing, but we don't take the time to take them to a closed closet to where they can get some fresh clothing. I'm simply trying to say it's not enough, child of God, to just say something and not do something. Amen. So, he touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt, and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man, verse 15, sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Now, because of what Jesus did, because he had compassion, because he observed his surroundings, because he saw the hurt in this mother, he not only gave her words of encouragement, don't weep, but he touched the coffin, he raised this son, he gave him back to his mother. Now, that was a missional act. That was an, a, a mission, an act, an act that was beneficial to this mother and to her son. But look at the effect that, that took place when Christ demonstrated what a disciple is really all about. Verse 16 said, fear gripped them all, and they began glorifying God, saying, a great prophet has arisen, has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. Now, that's verse 16. So what Jesus did not only had an impact on the life of the woman whose son was dead, who's now alive and back to her, but what Christ did also had an effect on the people around them, this crowd that was with them. And I hear, I'm here to say that as we are becoming closer to Christ, as we're becoming more of a disciple of Jesus, you never know what your act of mission is going to do, not only for the one that you are helping, but for the one that's who, who are observing. What he's done is he's increased, <coughs> he's increased uh, the faith of those around. He's increased the ability of those around to know and believe and understand that Christ is the way, that this lady is blessed. Now, the other thing that I want to point out is <clears throat> that Luke doesn't tell us that the crowd around them said, well, she got a blessing, so what? Big deal. What me? Ain't no big thing to me. But he says that, that the crowd was gripped with that. He said fear gripped them, but fear in the sense in this context is not that they were afraid. Fear in this sense is a sense of appreciation, of a sense of desire gripped them, uh, and they began to glorify uh, God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And if they were one, if there was anybody in that crowd that ever doubted whether or not God visits his people, now they have their answer. If there was anybody in that crowd that was wondering or had some doubt about the ability of God to do what God does, to help and to heal, and to raise folk from the dead, then now their question is answered, which suggests to me that when we look at this scripture, it ought to help you and I understand, as he raised this young man to uh, and restored him to his mother, 
from a dead situation, how many dead situations are you and I in? We ought to now be convinced that regardless of my dead situation, God can resurrect me and get me back on the right track. Regardless of my dead finances, my dead relatives, my dead situation, whatever that situation is that I was dealing with that's a dead situation, God can and will resurrect. And so that gives me encouragement because the people in the crowd, if I'm one of those in the crowd, I'm not sure. I don't know when God is going to raise my dead situation. I don't know when God is going to raise my, my, my dead uh, children who are being wayward. When I'm saying dead, I'm talking about a disgruntled, a, a dysfunctional uh, situation. I don't know when God is going to resurrect that, but what I do know is that he's able. So what he's demonstrated to me is that by raising this woman's son, he is able to raise my dead situation. And that's why I believe that the Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego made the statement that I don't know if God is going to deliver us when, he, when they were asked by the king, but their response is, I know he's able. So what it says is, it doesn't matter what time he delivers. It doesn't matter when he delivers. What I need to know, what's going to keep me going? What's going to keep me marching forward? What's going to let me know I can continue to go with my head up is that God is able, and in his time, then he will also deliver me from my dead situation. And so... Uh, the people were excited. The people's belief system was increased. The woman who was crying no longer is weeping over the situation. And the boy who was dead is now alive, who can then give to his mother, who can then be a support system to his mother. And so look at the win, 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 all from Jesus observing a situation and having compassion. I just said it, and I know I said a word right there. When you and I uh, is, is put ourselves in a position as a disciple of Christ to be observant around what God has placed us in, when you and I understand that we're not here where we are by incident or accident, but we're here by divine appointment, and because I'm here by divine appointment, the least I ought to do is look around and look at my surroundings and see where God wants me to, to act. See where God wants me to respond and not be afraid to ask myself the question, what is it, God, that you want me to do? You do remember that when Jesus heard that John the Baptist, his first cousin, had been beheaded, and Jesus wanted to get away from the crowd. He went to a desert place, the Bible says, and the crowd met him on the other side as he went in the ship. And so uh, uh, once he got on the other side, the Bible says he talked to people all day, and when the evening came, his disciples says, it's time to eat, but we don't have no food to feed them. Jesus said, you feed them. That was a strong commit. They ob Jesus observed the situation, told the disciples, no, don't send them away. You feed them. Of course, their comeback was their excuse, but Lord, we don't have the money. What we need to do is dismiss this crowd, send them into the villages where they can get food. Jesus said, no, you feed them, set them down <clears throat> uh, in groups of 50, and then let's figure out how we're going to feed. Well, the only thing we have, Lord, is a little boy, and all he did was bought his lunch, and he had two fish and five barley loaves. In other words, he had two sardines and, 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 and five biscuits, and they were many biscuits at that. And then Jesus took them and, and prayed over them and blessed and distributed, and everybody ate. Point that I'm making because Jesus observed that these folk needed to stay, not to leave, and they had a need to be fed, and that he was the one, or the disciples were the one, or together they were the one that needed to feed them, and he made that happen. Uh, I mean, that's a whole different message, but I just wanted to point out that the observation was the folk needed to be fed. The solution was you feed them. 
I think the same thing uh, here with us. Verse 17, this report concerning him went out all over Judea and in all the surrounding districts. So here we go. The lady, <coughs> our son, were blessed. The crowd around got blessed. And then the reputation of what God can do went out to the surrounding districts. Look at the ripple effect of this one compassionate person. Christ, one compassionate situation. Look at what that has done and look at what, thank you, and look at what uh, came from it. It went to areas that may or may not have known anything about Jesus. Now they're talking about it. These people may or may not have believed or, 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 or understood, but now they're talking about it. And I think that when we're doing this type of work, if we're doing it for God and not for ourselves, sooner or later, somehow or another, somebody is going to talk about it. And that's what we need to happen. We need somebody to talk about it. All right, verse 18. The disciples of John, that's John the Baptist, reported to him all uh, reported to him about all these things. Some and seeing two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord, saying, "Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else?" Now, that's a, a, a an odd question. In actuality, and I say it's an odd question. I say it's an odd question from the standpoint of how should we take that question? How should we interpret that question? Because John, who's asking the question, is the same John the Baptist that were baptizing folk at the Jordan, the same John the Baptist in his mother Elizabeth's womb, leaped when he heard the voice of Mary, who at the time was carrying Christ. The same John that when it came time for Jesus to be baptized, says, I'm not even worthy to unloose your, your, your shoelaces. I can't baptize you. The same John that Jesus says, yeah, but you got to do this, so let's do it. They did. And when Jesus came up out of the water in the Jordan, the Bible says that that heaven's microphone got turned on and the voice of God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This is the same John that's asking the question, are you the one or should we expect someone else? So the reason why I say that's an odd question for John to ask, because it would make common sense to think that if there was anybody who knew that he was the one, it would have been John. If there was anybody who would not or should not have a question about the Messiah, it should be John. So it makes me pause and wonder whether or not the question that John asked was for John's benefit or was it for his disciples' benefit. John, knowing that his time was short at the time that John asked the question, he's in prison, knowing that pretty much he's not going to get out, and he summons two of his disciples, two of the men who are following him, to go to Jesus and ask the question. So did he summons them to go and ask for him, or did he summons them to go and ask so that they could see for themselves that it is Jesus that they're going to be following. That is Jesus that they ought to be following. Because listen to and look at the response. Verse 20. When the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? At that very time, he cured many people of diseases. That's Jesus and afflictions, 
and evil spirits. And he gave sight to many who were blind. And he answered and said to them, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. The disciples who came from John, who was John's disciples, went to Christ only to see Christ do what John never did. The Bible never tells us that John healed anybody. The Bible never tells us that John gave sight to the blind. The Bible never tells us that John the Baptist healed those who had diseases and leprosy. It did tell us that he was in the wilderness crying out, that he was baptizing. But he also said, there will be one that comes after me that is greater than I. Could it be that what John needed his disciples to see is the one that you need to follow? And when they went to ask the question, they were it was demonstrated to them the power of Christ. And who would not want to be a disciple of a Jesus with this type of power? Now, I need to point out that what they also saw was Jesus' own mission. What mission was he on? Here it is. When they came, the mission that he was on, he was curing people of disease, diseases, of afflictions, of evil spirits. He was given sight to the blind. And then he says, now go tell what you say. I think that that's a twofold situation there for us to observe what Christ has done in the lives of others. We need to be able to tell folk what all Christ can do that we have witnessed. Catch what I'm saying. I ain't telling you to go tell what Christ can do that you don't know nothing about. Because I think maybe that is where many of us make the mistake. We want to talk about some stuff that we really don't know for ourselves. God knows how convincing we can be when we talk about stuff that we know about. You know how convincing you can be when you talk about stuff that you know about. You see... My tone of voice, my ability to describe, my conviction, uh, my demeanor when I talk about things that I've witnessed for myself versus talking about things that I have not witnessed for myself. There's going to always be a tone of doubt when I'm talking about stuff that I haven't witnessed for myself versus how I'm going to be convicted talking about stuff that I have witnessed for myself. That's why I can't nobody tell your story like you can tell your story. Because they weren't there when your story was being developed. They weren't there when God shined a light in your dark places. They weren't there when God got you out of stuff that you didn't even realize that you have gotten into and now God has gotten you out of. So your conviction, your witness should be on what God has done for you. It's okay, I believe, without a shadow of a doubt, to share what grandma has testified to and what mama has testified to and what the neighbor has testified to. But your most effective discipleship witness is going to be when you testify to what you and God have encountered. Your authenticity to convince and convict somebody that God is everything God says he is and then some is when you talk about your relationship with God. And I think, I, I think that when we do that, then it radiates with people. 
And when it radiates with people, what we can see is if God can do it for you, then he can do it for me. If God can lift you up out of, then he can lift me up out of. Whatever situation that I found myself in. And so, again, the mission work that Jesus was on is what convinced these two disciples that he was the one. Because what nobody else doing, what Jesus was doing. So what does your, as a disciple, what does your mission work do that demonstrates the power and the love of Christ? That will cause someone else to go and tell somebody else what I've seen. What missional journey are you on that you are helping someone? That, you, that God has chosen you to be a blessing, to bless somebody else. I think that we take that so lightly when we ought to have a deeper appreciation. Our worship, our worship, I believe, is more robust. It is more stronger. It is more convincing and convicting when my worship hinges on the fact that God decided that he was going to use me to be a blessing to someone else. Because when God decides he's going to use me to bless somebody, that means he trusts me to do what he tells me to do. He trusts that I'm going to follow through with his instructions. He trusts that I'm going to, if he, if he tells me to give $100, he's trusting that I'm going to give that $100. And so, it's a blessing to be trusted by God. I need to say that one more time. I say it's a blessing to be trusted by God to be used to be a blessing to somebody else. I, I, I don't know how you cut that, slice it or dice it, but what I know that we must start looking at the fact, not complaining, oh God, why me? Why is I'm the only one that seems like I'm doing the work? Why am I the only one that seems like I want to give somebody a ride and ain't nobody else? Everybody at the church got a car, but I'm the only one who wants to pick somebody else up. I'm the only one who wants to do this around the church. It's a blessing to be chose by God to do a task that becomes a blessing to somebody else because it means, it suggests that God is trusting you and when God trusts you to do it, he gives you the power to do it. And when God trusts you and gives you the power to do it, he also gives you the provisions to do it. And so, and so what a joy it is to know that God provided the power and the provision and decided to choose you to personally be uh, his, his, his tool as he blesses somebody else. Uh, that's why we have to be careful that when God uses us in that way, that the one that receives the blessing don't try to give us the credit. Uh, I just finished up. I, I told some of you that I was reading through the New Testament. I started from Acts. I read all the way to Revelation. I finished up Revelation uh, this morning. And one of the things that was glaring in the book of Revelation that John was talking about Whenever a certain event or act would happen, John would say, and I fell down and I, I worship when the angel uh, uh, showed me this and this angel showed me that. And the, each time the angel said, get up, don't you do that. Don't worship me. I am a fellow servant. Worship God. And we have to be careful that as God is using us to be a blessing to someone else, that we don't allow those who are being blessed to worship us because it comes from God. He's just using us as the conduit that makes a difference in the lives of the people. So you ought to count it all joy when God uses you. And, and I think about the fact that if you get a call at two o'clock in the morning that causes you to get up out of your bed because someone needs the help and, and God put it on their heart to call you, 
although it is an inconvenience on one end because it interrupts your sleep, and now you got to get up out of your bed and I'll be a blessing on the other because God decided to use you. Now, as I always say, don't get it twisted. Uh, God did not intend for any of us to be floor mats for people to walk on, misuse, and abuse. But I'm convinced that when you are a disciple of Christ, you know the difference. You know when it is God is using you to really help somebody, and you know when someone is trying to use you as a doormat, just to use you for using sake. I'm convinced that the closer you get to God, the more God uh, uh, evolves in your life and puts in you that spirit that tells you that this is what God wants and this is a fake. I know with me, there are times, and you see them, I see them, they're all over town. People are standing with signs talking about feed, you know, uh, uh, food, need, needing food, or will work for food, and they ain't willing to work because if they was willing to work, there's so many jobs out here that you can pretty much get a job anywhere you want at any time you want, and you could get uh, the food you need, uh, are hungry, are homeless, uh, and, and they expect you to give them some money. And what's interesting is I see them all the time. You see them all the time. I pass a whole lot of them by because I don't feel the spirit of God in me saying, give that person money. But then there are some that, that God says, give them something. And guess what I do? I give them something. But I am convinced that as a disciple of Christ, that spirit raises up in you and lets you know this is what God wants you to do. But at the same way, God protects his children. He ain't gonna let people just walk on you, walk over you. You doing what he asks you to do. You're being a disciple. You're trying your best to be the best you you can be in Jesus Christ. He ain't gonna let nobody just walk over you for walking over sake. That is not going to happen. And so when you become close, that discerning spirit is what some calls it, rises up, uh, rises up in you. Verse 22, and he answered and said to them, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. If you're ashamed of Christ, Christ made it so very plain this where he said, if you are ashamed of me before man, I will be ashamed of you before our father. Now, that verse of scripture, I think sometimes we read over it a little too quick. He says, if you are ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before my father. Now, if you think about where Christ is right now, he's sitting on the right hand of his father doing what? Making intercession for you and me. And if I'm ashamed of him, and he's sitting on the right hand of the father making intercession for, for me, and he's ashamed of me, that might suggest that he ain't gonna make no intercession when I need intercession made for me. That I hope you caught that. Amen. Yeah, I, I really hope you caught that. And so it is intended for me to represent Christ in such a way that I'm not ashamed. Paul made it so plain. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So I'm not ashamed of what people are dying about, of dying in, because of. I'm going to stand come hell or high water. So you got to think about, I don't want Christ ashamed of me before God the Father because he's sitting on the right hand of God the Father making intercessions for me. In other words, he's allowing God the Father to see me as the perfect creation that God created before sin entered the world. He's making that intercession. He's that go through. He's the one that's blocking for me so that I can keep on running this race. Because if not, I'm going to get tackled. And if I get tackled, that means I'm going down. So to have Jesus making intercession, I don't want him to be ashamed. I hope you got it. All right. When the messengers of John had left, 
he began to speak to the crowd about John. Now, this is why I say, who was the question for? Uh, in these last few minutes that we have left, just let me peek at this for just a moment. I said in the beginning, who was the question for? Look at what Christ says about John. He says, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? Question, a reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? Question, a man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal places. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And so he is, he is helping us to see his feelings and thoughts concerning John the Baptist. John's job, John's assignment, if you will, was to go and prepare the way for Christ. So Christ asked the question, who did you go see? Did you go see somebody that you thought would be dressed nicely? Well, you don't find that person in the wilderness. You find them in royal places. But John was there on assignment to fulfill the prophets, to fulfill what was written by the prophets. I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. And then Jesus says, I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. So the question that John asks, are you the one or should we expect another? Christ is coming back saying, there's no, there's no man born of women any greater than John is. So don't y'all give John down the road because of the question that he asked, because it could be that the question he asked was for somebody else. All right. Uh, I'll unpack that probably next week for those who need that to be unpacked. But I would challenge you to read that yourself and then let me know what you come up with. When all the people, I'm in verse 29, when all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice having been baptized with the baptism of John, verse 30. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. So those who were baptized by John understood those who weren't. Now look at who weren't baptized by John, the scribes and the Pharisees. What position did the scribes and Pharisees hold? They were the church of that day. They were the scholars of that day. They were those who were in the temple of that day. And they were also those who were on the other side of Christ because of jealousy, because they, they had created their, their own mechanism and it was all about them and not about God. And Christ was trying to get even the scribes and Pharisees to see that your motivation and your focus is in the wrong place. And I will say that to say this, I think we have to be careful so that we understand where is our motivation and where is our purpose? Because God's not gonna give you the power of God for a purpose that does not reflect who God is and what God is about. If we want the power as a disciple, Disciple living, following Christ, the power of the purpose that God is calling us to, then our purpose, it has to be that we are sold out to Jesus Christ as his disciple to represent him and reflect him. We're not the light. We're just a reflection of the light. The light is Jesus Christ. All right. 
we're coming almost to the end of our time. Uh, let me let me just kind of stop here. We'll pick up at verse 31 of Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, on next week, verse 31 of Luke's Gospel, chapter 7. And I'm going to look to see if I see anyone uh, that's, that uh, has written any questions. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, William Stocker, good to see you, man. We appreciate you and uh, hope that you're healing and getting better. Thank God for Reverend William Stocker. Amen. We want you to know that we pray for you and continue to pray uh, for you. I'm just looking at Brendan McCoy. Thank you for watching. We appreciate that much. Arnold, thank you for watching. Uh, we appreciate you as well. Uh, amen. Uh, I'm looking to see if I have any questions. Uh, thank God for Sister Christine Houston who uh, puts up all the scriptures that you see so that if you don't have your Bible, you can just read it right here uh, in, in the comment section, in the live chat section. Uh, thank you, Chris, for doing, for doing that. Let us continue to walk closer, to go deeper. The more word, I told you this in the first couple of weeks, the more word of God you get in you, the closer you're going to walk with Christ. It's impossible to have all of God's word in you and not walk with Christ on a deeper level. So we thank God for those of you who are joining us, who have joined us. I look forward to, look, share this with your friends, share this with your neighbors. It's Truthful Transformation Thursday. We're just wanting people to know and understand the joy. I saw you, Austin, when you said the joy of uh, being a disciple of Christ. I think more often than not, we look at church and look at, at discipleship as something that is a drag, something that is dull, something that uh, pulls uh, your life in the opposite direction. Well, it does pull your life in the opposite direction of the world because the world is going to hell. Uh, but we're going to that place where every day is howdy, howdy, and Sabbath will have no end. And so there is a joy to be a disciple of Christ with everything that comes with us walking lockstep with Jesus, there is still a joy simply because of the fact that we are pilgrims in this world. We're not here. We didn't come here. We weren't meant to stay. People die every day from this side of the Jordan. We didn't come here to stay, but our eternal home is in heaven for those who are disciples of Christ. Believe it or not, guess what? You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And where you spend eternity is going to depend on the choice that you make of whether you're going to accept Christ as your Savior and become a disciple of his or whether you are not. And if you're not, then hell will be your home. But believe me, the body dies, but the soul lives forever. And your soul is going to spend eternity somewhere. I suggest while you still have an opportunity, you still have breath in your body, you're still of a sound and conscious mind, that you choose Jesus and make Jesus your choice. I promise you that it is a decision that is the most important decision that you've ever made in your life. And when you make up your mind, I'm not going to be like, some folk who would tell you that once you come to Christ, once you accept Christ as your Savior, that life is going to be a bed of roses, that everything is going to be hunky-dory, because that's the biggest lie that has been told. When you accept Christ as your Savior, then heaven rejoices, but the devil gets mad. And when the devil gets mad, then he comes after you even the more. And so now life is not going to be a bed of roses and night life is not going to be hunky dory. But the good news is that you got a God that can. You got a God that's able and you got a God that will protect you. And keep in mind what goes on on this side of the journey, what goes on on this side of the Jordan is what will determine what you do throughout eternity. And I'm telling you that there is no better life than a life with Christ. I am a witness to that, and God has allowed me to live long enough to tell somebody, it is so sure enough good to be a child of God. All right, that's our lesson for tonight. I hope that uh, you, it's been a blessing to you. I hope that you've gotten something out of it. Please help us share this with others, 
and we look forward to seeing you again on next Thursday at 6.30 p.m. on our Truthful Transformation Thursday. To God be the glory for these marvelous things that he has done. Thank you again, and we'll see you on next Thursday. Let us pray out. God, we love you. We adore you. We magnify your most holy and righteous name. Thank you for the, those who have joined us on our social media platform. Thank you for those that are with us here in the sanctuary. We pray, God, that your word uh, would penetrate the hearts of your people, and God, that we will be better on tomorrow than we were today. Help us, God, to take this word and embed it into our hearts that we don't sin against you. Help us to become more determined to be more like you, God, through these lessons that we are learning through Truthful Transformation Thursday. We appreciate you. We love you. And you is, will always be our God. Please allow us to always be your children. Keep us safe until we meet again. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right. We'll see you all next Thursday. Have a wonderful evening.